Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ani Dubaneshi Queen, Dijana Kaz, Migazi and Dodem. I'm really happy to see everyone. This is our um, final webinar Wednesday for November for Native American Heritage Month, um, where we have been really talking about um, Indigenous identity, Native identity. What does that mean? We've talked about um, enrollment and blood quantum and tribal affiliation and connection. And um, we've talked about the diversity of who we are as Indigenous people. And um, today we really want to jump into, um, given all of the conversations that we've had and many more that we will continue to have, what does it mean to be a good relative? Um, so to start us off in a good way, um, Rebecca, I believe, um, will open us up with a prayer and then we will do some introductions and get started. Wokula, thank you. So I'm burning some cedar and sage just, you know, to put us in a good way, right? That's the smoke. So we have um, the prayer. Uh, Tukashila, great mystery. Teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intuition, my inner knowing, and the, all the senses of my body. The blessings of my spirit teach me to trust these things so that I may enter the sacred space and love beyond my fear and thus walk in balance with the passion of each and glorious son. Wobila, washte, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And again, I'm Nicole Matthews. I'm the executive director at MUSAC. Um, Christine, you wanna do an introduction? Sure, bonjour everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christine in English, from Eagle Clan. I'm up here in the snowy, flowy, very cold, white earth res. Feels good to be from Minnesota. Winter has finally arrived. Yeah, and I'm the uh, Education and Prevention Coordinator with Minnesota. So welcome, everybody. Shayla. Nancy Nisi Gasawin, Shayla Beaumont. Welcome everyone. I'm the Elevate Uplift Coordinator here at MUSAC. And Rebecca. I'm Beta Washte. Good day to everyone. I do um, some of the sex trafficking work at MUSAC in Indian Country in Alaska. Just a little shout out promo. We're having our New Orleans conference. January 24th, 25th, and 26th. So just a heads up, keep an eye on our website and our Facebook page for information on that. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Very exciting. Um, so, you know, I was a part of the very first conversation in this series. Um, and I know there has been conversation since then, but really talking about you know, given um, the complexity of, um, you know, our identities as Native people, and, you know, I think we're like the only people in, um, in our country that have to prove who we are with some, um, you know, our certificate, um, a degree of Indian blood, right, that, that some people have referred to as pedigree papers, and, and, and some people have used to divide us. Um, and we have used oftentimes to divide each other and, um, and looking at that and then looking at the diversity of our communities, right? And many of us are mixed with, um, with other things and, um, and, you know, have the full breadth of, of identities. And at the end of the day, it's about how are we um, good relatives to each other? And what does that even mean? You know, I hear that a lot. I hear a lot um, of people talk about be a good relative. And to me, being a good relative is, um, <clears throat> it really goes back to like, um, if I have, if I'm thinking about my relatives, 
how do I want to be in community with them, right? I'm opening up my doors to them. Um, I, I feed my relatives. I, I love them. I give them grace when there's um, mistakes made, right? Because we're all imperfect human beings that make mistakes. Um, I seek to understand and to listen um, and, and have the full um, compassion and love. Um, and so that's kind of what I think of when I think of what does it mean to be a good relative. I don't know what um, what you all think. I'd like to give a shout out to the first person I ever heard speak these words, which is Tilly Black Bear, right? Who opened one of the first shelters in Indian country. So Tilly Black Bear with NIWRC, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. So they have webinars available on their website. And those were her words where we understand, you know, through the work of Sandy Whitehawk, right, of foster care and adoption and being a cultural orphan. I'm out here on the West Coast, so it's very complicated. But then allowing folks to come home to our communities, whatever, you know, and we went through that through every week of these Native Heritage Month series, right? We talked about all the difficulties that we approach with love and not shame, right? And being kind to each other and welcoming people home. And that includes me, I'm a descendant, I'm not enrolled. So I'm a part of this process too, which is very different than all the other things in Indian country, but like just being kind to each other, welcome each other home, sharing knowledge, sharing language and songs and ceremony. And I hope, Amber, I'm not talking too fast for you, but Wopila, thank you so much. Then going off of what Rebecca said, you know, in um, both communities, both in an urban setting and tribal communities, just being kind to one another, you know, um, a lot of colonialization really worked hard to knock down our indigenous beliefs and working hard as a community, having a tight knit community, especially um, the generational um, matriarchs and the cultural teachings that were pa passed down from generation to generation. And um, when I was speaking on um, being kind in both settings, you know, welcoming our urban um, relatives in a tribal setting and not being, um, be more welcoming instead of treating them as outsiders or someone who isn't a part of the community. And also in an urban setting, you know, welcome our um, brothers and sisters, our relatives who are moving from a, from a tribal community. And learning each tribe and like learning each tribal beliefs and practices. Yeah, I kind of I agree with everything that's been said, right? Like one of the things that I would add is that you know we're 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 all doing the best we can with the circumstances that have been given to us, right? We each have a story that brought us to who we are and how we are now right? There's a set of circumstances in everybody's lives. And, and I think I think what I'm really getting at is that um, to be a good relative means that you kind of have to recognize the whole person, right? Like none of us have like all the answers or all the pieces in place. None of us in recent times have had safe access to our cultural practices and language and ritual. And I think to be a good relative means that you leave room for those of us who are learning, right? Like these um, little things that we learn along the way as we go. And yeah, like it's by design that some of these things are missing or that we are taught to kind of fight over the little bit of resources that are left available to us, right? Like we'll put it against one another. So being a good relative to me means like pushing that aside and kind of getting at what's, what's really happening. Right? Yeah, those are some of my thoughts. Anyways.
Yeah, I agree. And I think like the whole um, notion of relative is even complicated, right? Because our, our communities have been so torn apart from um, colonization and from relocation and from all the things that um, tear our families and our communities apart, that the notion of even relative is a complicated um, idea. And, you know, sometimes we have more chosen relatives than, um, than familial relatives. And so when I think about, you know, what does it mean to be a good relative? It means all of those people. And really how we look at each other from tribal nation to tribal nation as relatives. And also how we look at, um, you know, our plant relatives as relatives. And we look at, you know, um, our animals and four-leggeds and um, all of those are our relatives. And so it's not only the um, physical, you know, human beings, but it's um, all of our relatives, which, which then makes me think about the whole notion of that's connected to this being a good relative is around reciprocity. And um, that it's not only when you're a good relative, it's also about giving back and not only taking, right? Like, and it, and it's about offering something if you're asking for something. And, um, you know, we used to do, um, Christine, you remember we used to do the girls retreats for a number of years, the native girls retreats. And that's something that we really talked to the girls about was reciprocity. And, and, you know, sometimes they don't always have, I remember one of the things we talked to them about was, um, they might not always have tobacco with them, um, but maybe they have a piece of hair they can offer for that plant relative that um, that they want to pick. Or um, there's other ways to provide that reciprocity and that that teaching around um, us as relatives with with everything. I was remembering also about a um, somebody was talking, telling the story about leaving an acorn, right? Like leaving an acorn. So it's not so much about I don't know the value about what the rest, like the gift is, but it's about the bujo uh, Hercules. It's about the the feeling or the genuine exchange of something. Right, so it doesn't have to. Kitty Boots is joining us, so it's not about necessarily like how much something is worth, but it's the teaching behind that is that we're all in this together, right? Like this idea of not being in a hierarchy, but being in a circle that each has something to contribute to the whole, right? And I think that we sometimes can easily forget that because we're taught about the hierarchy from the moment you know, we're born, you know, when they put us in a, a little pink or blue blanket, when they put us in rows in a school, um, you know, who, who's, who's the boss and who do we listen to and who has to be quiet? Like we're taught all of these ways that is just not natural to us, right? And so really thinking about any time that we can interrupt that and sort of challenge when we see harmful behavior around us or just somebody straight up being mean right like like I think we we I you know I missed a couple of weeks there too where there had been some conversations about you know there are those who will use trickery and and dishonesty to get access to resources right like that's a thing and you know there's just a, a lot of room there that we can still find kindness and have conversations and it doesn't have to be me, right? Actually, sometimes it does, right? Like maybe not mean, mean, but we have to have the real honest conversations from a place of love, right? Like that's also a reality. And like when we 
talk about treating each other as relatives, we have to understand that there's foster care and adoption. And what are we at like four or five generations of the boarding school experience where parents didn't, where a child grew up who didn't have aunties and uncles and grandparents and parents to love them and teach them like hugging and love language and and then all of the violence that happened. Um, where do we give forgiveness and leniency to re-teach love and compassion to generations? Like it's all the things, all it's, this is a big conversation for an hour long webinar, right? But when we talk about all of the ways that colonization has harmed Indian country, and we're just still doing this stuff, we're coming together and talking about love and compassion and rebuilding. You know, we're a hundred, it's 2022. The Carlisle Indian School closed in 20, 2019 or 18. And we're still rebuilding that. And I think we need to give each other and ourselves a little bit of leniency that we care for each other, that we're still healing because right? My grandparents were born during that age. So, right. It's all, it's all present. If that makes sense. I agree. And Christine, you brought up like when you were saying, you know, sometimes it isn't so nice, right? Like, um, because it also is about having those hard conversations and when we love each other, and when we're a good relative to each other, it's also about accountability, right? Because love means accountability. Um, and how are we accountable to each other as relatives? How are we accountable to our community as relatives? And so that's all part of the conversation too. It's not just about like, I'm gonna, you know, um, you know, make excuses and forgive you for all the things you've done. Like we're gonna also hold you accountable you know, I love my kids enough to hold them accountable so that, so that they learn, right? So, and so that we all learn. And, um, and I learn things from my kids all the time and they hold me accountable when I've done something um, that wasn't right or, or maybe hurt them. Um, and so I think that's also a part of what it means to be a good relative is to have, have those conversations too. Oh my gosh, we we're just having this conversation at a, on a call just previous to this one. So the conversation was about sexual violence prevention, and we we're talking about how, you know, it's 2022, and there has been a lot of work done around sexual violence for women, right? So domestic violence and sexual violence, there's been a lot of evolving over the decades of this work, right? And there's also like some social structures about support systems for women and girls who've been sexually assaulted. You know, there's, there's resources available. There's all these different kinds of things. But um, one of the things that there's a, still a gap in is for, you know, those who, are, the, who don't identify as a woman across the gender spectrum, particularly our you know, male relatives or um, gender non-conforming relatives, right? So there is less resources available but also in real, like you can talk about the resources from like a, a program perspective and all the things, and that's important, but just from a relative to relative perspective, right? To be good relatives to one another, that accountability that you were just talking about, when you love somebody, you, you hold them accountable, but that's even weighted with English baggage when you say the word accountability, right? Like what what that accountability is, is that I love you enough and I see you enough where you're at that I'm making this effort to bring this to your attention, right? And that's something like profound and beautiful because we all just want to be seen and know that we matter, right? Like we want to love and be loved, but we want to be seen and know that we matter to somebody. And I feel like, you know, in the work of sexual violence, we don't all get to be seen and get to be heard all the time, right? Like that's a, that's a thing. So yeah, yeah. And yeah, going like, to, oh, sorry, Christine. <laughs> and just providing that individualized support, right? To be a good relative. Um, 
and our accountability to the community and just providing that individualized support, whether it's cultural or, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Well, the support looks different for everybody, right? And that's part of it is like what, we don't all need the same things, right? We're not all going to respond to the same things. And so also part of that being a good relative is to, to take the time and put the energy into finding what the solutions are, right? And that goes for even complicated relationships around race and enrollment and blood quantum and all the things, right? Like, getting to know what the story is behind the the things that we may that may seem like they're wrong or going wrong or going badly or being toxic like what's the story behind it and can we take the time to figure out what it is so we can interrupt it I agree <clears throat> I mean I certainly think um you know, I think about it, like the love and accountability and all of the things connected. And, and um, there's certainly enough people that want to tear us down just to tear us down. And so, you know, part of that love and accountability and being a good relative is how are we helping each other up, right? Like lift each other up. Um, and even accountability is about lifting each other up because I think we're all, we're all um, better when we, when we learn and when we can, um, do things differently and when, and aren't causing harm. And, um, and when we see each other and um, make space for each other. And I totally agree with you about when we think about who have we built the services for and who do we, um, you know, most um, see around, you know, the work of sexual violence. And also that's, be and that is because of you know, who have been the leaders in the movement and um, the prime, you know, the, the higher numbers of victimization and all of the reasons, right, that 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 happens and that's valid and real. And also um, all of our relatives have been impacted by sexual violence. And so we also need to make sure that um, when we're talking about the work around sexual violence and the work of ending sexual violence, that that includes all of our relatives and not only our female identified relatives. Speaking of relatives, Rebecca, I love that. <laughs> my gentle giant, my baby boy. Yeah. So that kind of brings me back to the conversation we had on the 23rd. We had Jennifer Brewer and Vivette Jeffries from the South. <laughs> And, you know, there is and there has been a lot of yuck with programmatic funding, right? When you're federally recognized, you get federal funding for DV and SA services and sex trafficking. But when you're state recognized, the funding doesn't trickle down. So I do want to give a shout out to NAAAV, Native American Advocates Against Violence, that are in the South or from Virginia. They've been operating for 10 years without a dollar of federal or state funding to provide services for domestic violence, sexual violence, and sex trafficking. They've done that. They brought all of the Virginia tribes together, and they created a bit of a cohort. They meet, and it was a magical site visit when I went to Indian Neck, Virginia. And they all came together for a site visit, and they do this work, all of our work, without a dollar of funding. It's all volunteer work. And, you know, it's been kind of crazy from the Pacific to the East Coast when these tribal communities that were colonized in 1491, man, 1491, not 100 years ago. That's like 100 centuries ago. And they have created these spaces to support their community. And they're doing it with their own personal cell phones. They're developing, um, uh, strategic plans to do this work while a lot of Indian country, I'm sorry to say it, I said it on the 23rd, a lot of Indian country goes on YouTube and watches their powwows and their dances and looks at their regalia and calls them pretendians or frauds or all the things because the East Coast tribes have a different regalia, 
a different dance style, a different song, a different drum than what we know in Gathering of Nations and like Black Hills powwow, right? So this lateral oppression happens in our communities, but then if that happens, it is going to affect our survivors of trafficking, sexual violence and DV, right? So it's about building bridges more than um, what was very popular in the early 2000s, which was cutting each other down on the internet, right? So it is about love and compassion and treating each other as relatives. So I'm out here in Pennsylvania. So I'm between the North and the South, center in the middle, and I'm just sharing those voices. So thank you for listening. Thank you. was thinking when you're talking Rebecca about how like what does it look like to really so it's very easy for most people to find the bad or find the wrong or find the incorrect or find the less than right like I don't know if that's a human trait or if it's you know we just learned it through all the different places that we learn things it's so easy to find those those bad things right and, and it's much harder work to find the good and find the solutions and find the commonality. It just takes a little bit more energy. Maybe it's not harder. Maybe it's not bad for everybody. It's maybe not easy or hard for everybody, right? It's we're all on a continuum of where we're at. But that's really also it too, is that it has to do with, you know, what kind of support system did you have growing up? you know, were you seen, were you safe to learn your practices or were you not, right? Like it has all the things to do with our, who raised us in our environment that we were raised in, in our ability to have compassion and patience for others, right? And so sometimes if you didn't grow up with that, if I didn't grow up with that, I have to learn it. Like as an adult, I can make a choice to learn it and find commonality in, in places where those teachable moments, right? Instead of tearing somebody down because we all grow and are better for it, right? Well said. The end, we're done. No. <laughs> I agree, right? Like it's so, yeah. We, sometimes we talk about it like it's so complicated and yet it's so simple of, you know, how do we love and support each other? And um, yeah. Yes. And I think like the impact, sorry, Christine, the impact of colonization is that like we hold all the shame for not knowing the stuff that was intentionally stripped from us and taken from us, right? Like we carry all the shame, all the things, all the, um, and that shame doesn't even belong to us. Just like how we talk about for victims of sexual violence, they carry all the shame. Um, they carry secrets. They carry like how many, um, victims have you worked with that never even told the first time, or maybe the second time or the third time. And maybe it was the fourth time that they finally told, and they're carrying all the shame of all of those things that happened like they did something wrong, right? And so when we're talking about identity, um, you know, there's a reason why we don't have safe access oftentimes to our spirituality and to our practices and to our cultural knowledge and language and ways. There's reasons why we don't have fluent speakers in every tribe and um, all the cultural um, practices that, you know, are that everybody knows that we can pass on to our kids. And um, there's a reason for that. It was intentional that we don't have that. And yet we carry the shame because we feel less than um, because we don't know those things because we know we're supposed to know those things. Um, and they're in there, right? Like they're in our DNA, like, um, it's part of who we are as indigenous people. And, and like you said, Christine, we can make that choice to, um, to seek people out. And, and sometimes we can find those people and sometimes we can't, right? Like it's, it's hard, um, but yeah. 
No, and when we say like those were intentional upon us, you know, and when blood quantum comes into a thing and whether it's um, the social structures in the tribal community or any community really, and when the teachings are, how do you say, like maybe off limits to some and yes, like working towards seeking it out, but um, like, how could we, like, how do we regain our resiliency values? And it's like, no, everyone is welcome. Everyone is open, opening to learning. And that's one thing I really appreciate about MUSAC and the work that we're doing, you know, coming from a kind, resilient place of, we're all relatives. We're all here. This is an open learning safe space. I mean, it's not easy, right? Like, like one thing that the pandemic taught us is that a, that we could all be sitting in our pajamas at home on a TV screen, talking to each other <laughs> and get a lot of work done. But the other thing that we learned is that we had to be intentional about staying in community with one another, right? And so at MUSEC, every morning at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, we show up on the screen, you know, and it's different for, you know, Pennsylvania, we got Montana in the house, right? Like all across the country, we show up every morning and we take a moment to see each other as human beings, right? As relatives in the work, because our work is so brutal and we're gonna go out and do this work to people who are not used to having these conversations, right? And it's brutal, it's, it's painful, it makes me cry sometimes, it makes me mad, it breaks my heart, like it breaks, like on my knees crying kind of breaks my heart, right? And I need that place where I can find that, I don't know, that shared understanding without explanation. Like we all need that. What does it look like to find your relatives that are going to give you that shared understanding without explanation, right? And that takes a little work to, you know, we're all human beings. We all have our own traumas when we come in, our, our little suitcase of baggage that we come wheeling in, right? And what does it take to work through that and really see each other, see beyond those sort of wounded places of woundedness um, that we, you know, those scars that we've earned, right? And how do we, how do we love on those places where sometimes this, they're still scabs, they're not even scars and wounds, they're like scabs that are kind of infected or weeping in one another, right? And to be able to just love on one another and see past that, like that's, that's being a good relative to me, right? Colonization happened in a million different ways. And sometimes it's different between every individual or family or tribe or community or region or state. And when we recognize that, I think we're gonna get somewhere to start healing where my story is different than Christine's story is different than Shayla's story is different than Amber's story is different than Nicole's story. And when we allow that space to see outside our own trauma and stories, and we open up that, I don't know what it is. We, we open up our heart speak with our traditional values. We're going to get somewhere and stop lateral oppression, crabs in a bucket and all those like clicky words. Right. So Christine, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that. I gotta add one more thing about what I was thinking too, is that also, you know, I have this color skin, right? And this color hair and all the things. And so I show up in the world looking like this. It was not my choice who I was born to. My mama and daddy made me. Here I am looking like this being who I am, right? So also hand in hand with sort of navigating our own woundedness or whatever, like we also have to navigate the places where our privilege is, right? Like I have to acknowledge and own this skin color carries with it a lot of privileges. I have to live with and own the fact that when I disclosed my violence, mom believed me. The second I uttered the word, she believed me. There's a privilege that comes with that. It changed the path of my journey because she believed me, right? And all the many different ways that privilege shows up for us. So it's not that we're asking people to sort of, you know, disregard all, all the things that, that make people mean and 
the violence and all the things that we're kind of been talking about, right? But it's the both and not the either or, right? Like it's, it's all of it. It's all of it. Like I can still own it and do my best with, with this skin I'm in um, and not take up resources that belong to other folks, right? Like I got to do my own work on that. Like every day I have to own it, honor it, work with it, right? I think that's so important because you're right. You can't change the vessel that you were, you know, like you're the, that the world sees that. Um, and whether that's, you know, light hair or skin, I certainly have very light skin myself and like there's privilege. Right. And, um, and if we ignore it and pretend like we don't have privilege, then that is also causing harm. Um, and so, and it's, it's about, not only recognizing the privilege, but about what do we do with that? Um, and then how are we also lifting up people who have less privilege, right? So we're not like, oh, let me just stand out front and like have all the privilege in the world. Like, how are we also bringing along people with us and lifting up people with less privilege? Um, and and it is, I think, an, an everyday, always working on, you know, I think about like, when you think about anti-racism work or anti-oppression work, it's not like a, oh, I went to this training and it was a one and done. I know all the things now. And so I'm better. And now I don't have to ever think about that again. Right. It's about how do you move through the world differently? Um, and, and what does that look like in your everyday life? Not just uh, when I go to this training to make it look good. Um, and then the other thing I think, you know, that you talked about, um, around being a good relative is, you know, how we show up for each other, even at music every day at 9 a.m. Um, and not with our work selves necessarily, but our human selves of um, checking in with each other about how are you? Um, because it's hard. It's hard. And, um, and this you know, the, certainly the past couple of years have been extremely hard and we've been in isolation and we've been away from each other. Um, and we've lost people and, um, we've grieved together and sep and separately. And, um, and so to be able to show up with each other for, you know, a growing, um, staff that didn't all know each other, that are all just getting to know each other, um, to to be intentional about that, I think creates that that world that we're trying to create, right? Like that, how you how are you a good relative? And then also, we don't just start out with like our check in. You know, we've added prayer into that. Um, we've also added like, what are you grateful for? And having everybody think about what they're grateful for, because that shifts the way you you think when you start to think about the things that we're grateful for, right? Like we had a blizzard yesterday here in Minnesota, and I'm certainly grateful that someone came with their snowblower and, um, and snowblowed my driveway. So I didn't have to, you know, grateful for good relatives. And so even when there's like challenging times or, um, you know, we, there's always things to be grateful for and, um, and to really be present with each other, I think is a gift that we also give to each other is our presence and um and it builds community in a different way i think and it makes um it has helped me to feel closer to you know our, the largest staff we've ever had and across the country because we've never had a staff like this that's been across the country like this so um but we're still able to build community and to be good relatives to each other And sometimes it's literally just having the an hour a day to check in with each other on my kids, my dogs, my house, my lawn, my water pipes, winter fuel, all the things just to like be with each other on that personal level, just kind of opens doors to allow us to be vulnerable when bad things happen or great things happen to like build relationships based on just life stuff. 
So I really appreciate our morning check-ins. I mean, really yeah. that's about interrupting oppression because oppression, one of the pillars of oppression is to objectify, right? When you can turn somebody or something into an object, it's easy to cause harm, right? And that happens on our, on our daily lives on the level of our daily lives and our daily interactions. And so we could very easily fall into a rut at work to just like, oh, this is the job that has to get done. Yay, Afton's in the house. Welcome, welcome. And what does it look like to, again, love each other enough, right? Like if we're talking about white skin privilege and you know, the, the, the responsibility that comes with that privilege, like how do we call in each other instead of call them out? Like call in, like what does that look like? All the things and welcome Miss Afton. Yeah, I apologize for coming on a little late. Um, I was doing some work for our National Clearinghouse Project. So um, thank you for everyone's conversation. I was listening in a little and I heard about our gratitude. I feel like sometimes um, when we do have our check-ins, it, it does make you mindful of your own privileges that despite our upbringings, um, it's still very much survivor led that, that, you know, we're, we're in a place of, and process of healing and the privilege to even, um, to, to check our own needs and, and consider, um, our growth and that the opportunity for gratitude. I'm like, housing is such a privilege and, and just thinking about what we have in our moment and how we're taking care of ourselves. Um, there are so many survivors and people who are in the midst of trauma that where that that is still not a right that we have and what we fight for. So thank you, Linda, for initiating that in our morning check-ins. Do we have any comments or questions in the Facebook chat? If anyone can see that, I don't see any so far. I haven't seen any. Afton, I would love to invite you to um, jump in around like, what does it mean to be a good relative? Like when we think about, you know, all of the conversations we've had this month um, and this really being the, not the final one, because we are certainly going to have more conversations about this, but the final one this month about what does it mean, given everything that we've talked about, what does it mean to be a good relative to each other? I think for me, it was probably one of the biggest learn, uh, lessons I've ever learned in my life is that we sometimes rally around um, cancel culture, especially it's um, the presence in um, dominant society, but being a good relative is giving the benefit of the doubt. It's the opportunities that we learned. It's the people that we cross in our paths who teach us those lessons. And that's actually what, what creator intended us for is that that's our life journey. Whether it's a red road, it's, it's not linear, it changes. And just having compassion for each other that I am gonna make mistakes is that I've made mistakes and it just makes me a better person. When I, when I do encounter these people that cross my path, I know I'm definitely a different person than I was even yesterday. You know, even the little things in our life is that if we choose a salad over some fried bread, there is a change in our life. And it's being a good relative when we, um, when we exchange that compassion and it's really, it's, it's made in the love for ourselves, that if we have a good positive image of ourselves, we'll have a good positive image of the next person. And that if we make a mistake, we hope that, that someone else will give us that grace um, as we make changes and being more mindful without canceling or calling each other out um, without any intent of forgiveness. So that's something that I often think of, you know, so don't hold me accountable if I get a cheesecake tomorrow. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding, but thank you. I love that you just said that because we're going through these societal changes, right? And it's ebbing and flowing and growing and all the things, but like woke got a little broke. Cancel culture is for like maybe a 5% of like severely mean-spirited, uncompassionate folks. It Cancel culture needs to exist for that. But 95% are educational moments where do we want to shut folks down when we could have a conversation, right? And empathize and be compassionate and educate each other. 
instead of just like getting them fired from their job, evicted from their house, all the things that come with cancel culture. So Afton, I love that you said that because I think woke is broke and we need to fix it into whatever comes next and be more thoughtful and educational about it. So thank you for saying that Afton. If that's what you meant, I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like I've had that thought and vision for a while that we need to educate and share information instead of just shutting people down and destroying their lives. Yeah, it's so easy to talk about dismantling um, systemic racism, systemic racism. And I was even thinking about like predominantly white institutions and how we decolonize academics. We understand that there is so much privilege and access to having language, education, words, conceptualizing things in an academic setting where um, it could e easily be understood in a really dominated level of, of the English language. And so when we talk about forgiveness, it's like we also need to dismantle the, the cancellation, understanding that there's so much privilege in, in having this experience that teaches us. So I wholeheartedly agree in giving people second chances. Even when we talk about the movement is that in our hardest times, we've made so many mistakes and that we had hoped that someone would walk us through that with the love and hold our hand through it. So. I think that's one of, as I, as I get older and I'm exiting my twenties, I, I just think so much about that. And, um, Scorpio babies, we're all about change and transformation and I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I have to add a thought about, um, so there is a time and a place when we have to address things, right? Like legit, you have to address something that is harmful and, but what does it, what does it mean to find a like a solution that is not punitive or you know like about breaking the other person down where is a place for mutual growth like that's a real tough thing to find sometimes because we're human beings and we respond with anger and hurt and betrayal and like all the things that show up in real human beings in real times right for lots of reasons but at the end of the day like what do we what do we what do we want us to learn from whatever it is? And is that mutual solution going to be better for all of us, right? And it probably is. I keep reflecting back to that too and thinking of being a good relative, especially in advocacy for um, everyone and not just our indigenous communities, but really meeting them where they're at, Christine, like you mentioned, like that mutual solution, um, you know, when, when we're doing um, direct services, sometimes, you know, getting overworked or when we're just trying to do as much things as we can, when really it's unrealistic and, you know, we don't want to just check a box, but really making sure that we're doing um being a good relative and supporting the moves that they wholeheartedly want or that they know what's best for them and that that was just what i was thinking about of being a good relative in advocacy this is so nerdy solutions not solvents just, kidding. just toxic <laughs> Ick einstein over here bill nye on the call <laughs> So what I live um, in Pennsylvania, we don't have a state recognized or federally recognized tribe, but we have the Carlisle Indian School, which is the first right boarding school. So it's a very unique community. And I moved to a river town. It's an old fisherman's town. There's no garages in the town. It's all um, boat camp shelters, right? Doesn't fit a car. So Anyway, my neighbor has lived here for seven generations of this Appalachian mountain town. And I moved in and he saw that I was not white. And he said, what are you? You know, the whole thing, you're exotic. What are you? Right. All that happened. And I said, well, I'm native and I'm gypsy. And he said, do you get your $40,000 a year? <laughs> I was like, I wish bro, but like I had to educate and I could have been mad at him. I could have scorned him, but Harry is across the street and he's a wonderful neighbor, man. He like shovels and does all the things and he's wonderful, but he just knew what he thought he knew. So it was about being just cool and thoughtful and kind and having the conversation that you shouldn't maybe meet your first native and ask them if they get their first 
free 40 grand a year from the government. And like, I talked to him and he's a wonderful ally and he's educating his children and his grandchildren. And sometimes it's just a little five minute conversation that's this big to just either get mad or participate. And that happens in our movement with domestic violence, sexual violence, trafficking, and just like being neighbors, that we have to have more, um, I guess, love and compassion when we meet these moments where we can decide mad or glad, right? So I just wanted to offer that. To add a quick thought about, humor. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just have to add a quick thought about also, we don't have to carry other people's weight either. Right, like knowing when to set those clear boundaries and when the fight is not the fight, but when the conversation is worth it, when there could be some some change there. And we got to follow our instinct on that. And we're gonna win some and we're gonna lose some, right? But we can't, it's not up to us to like carry all the weight either. It it around being native, around being a survivor, all the things, right? Sometimes I like to reframe things in a, in a humorous way. Like when people say, um, like my first thought was like, I don't know, I, I get a hookup on ham, you know, like I get a hookup on a free turkey. No, but but other ways to to kind of use humor is that if, if we get free access to college, wouldn't there be more Native graduates? Wouldn't we be in higher roles where the glass ceiling we've broken not only for women, but people of color, especially Indigenous folks? Or if we do get an increased amount of per cap, wouldn't we have successful entrepreneurs who would be more present than dominant, like in mainstream? Um, wouldn't we have more brick and mortars? Like I, I think about so many things and I, I try to use humor in, under, in getting people to understand that, that if these stereotypes were true, you wouldn't have these questions right now. So I think about some of that. So I, I'm really listening and hearing and, and even understanding and expanding what, what I think or know. So thank you. Makes me think about like um, teachable moments, right? Like, um, and sometimes knowing when, when it's a teachable moment and when it's just time to walk away. Cause sometimes it's just, um, it's just like, gonna be more frustrating right you just need to walk away um but there are those teachable moments where uh, maybe it's not done from a malicious place but it's done from an ignorant place of not knowing and um and they can hear you and and you can teach them something new and then there's places where it's done to be harmful um, and disrespectful. And sometimes you just have to walk away and know when that is. And sometimes even then, I think there's may, there's maybe times when, um, when we can still teach someone, um, even when it is done from maybe a not so great place. And, um, so I think there's, you know, knowing, knowing when to, and sometimes we just don't have the energy to know, to jump in, right. Sometimes, um, even when it's done from a good place, sometimes it's, you just don't have the energy to be able to, uh, to educate someone. But I think there's a lot of teachable moments. And I think there's a lot of stereotypes about who we are. And um, a lot of, you know, misunderstandings about Native people, and the resources that we have or don't have and the things that we have access to or don't have access to. Um, the fact that we are not all the same. Um, we don't all come from one tribe. We don't all have the same language and practices. We don't all live in teepees. We don't all, you know, it's, we're not all the same. And so um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about us. And I think the harshest conversations I've ever had were not with, um, other communities, it's internal with other natives. That's where it can be sometimes the most painful, right? Not enrolled state, federal community descendant. And that's where, you know, I know it's super cliche, but walking in two worlds, some I'm gypsy and native, I'm two tribes and gypsy. So I'm not enrolled. And I've had the 
most hurtful conversations have come out of that. And we do that, which is super sad. Um, we do that to our own, right? And that's dirty laundry we're not supposed to talk about, but that's why we're here, right? To be kind and loving to each other, to heal ourselves and each other. Agreed, agreed. So we are coming up on the three o'clock hour and I want to give people an opportunity to give some final um, thoughts and about this and um, yeah. So does anybody want to jump in with some closing thoughts or comments? I still have more to say about all the stuff we've been talking about, <laughs> but closing thoughts, I guess really, I mean, what Rebecca was talking about a second ago about how sometimes our own people can be the meanest, right? Like even then you have to pick your battles in terms of what's worth, um, I mean, we're not in the business of changing people's minds, right? But we are in the business of like expanding, expanding, love and com community and compassion right like that that's the role of an advocate that's that's the you know the role of a human being who came to this particular place at this particular time right is to be love and all the things so it's just uh, you know pick your battles like if it's not worth the battle don't fight it because you can't fight crazy either I mean that's my little saying from way back is you can't fight crazy like people's sometimes people's trauma is just too much and that's their journey and they have to take it and it's okay right like we don't have to defend ourselves there's nothing to defend like if you're just if you can put your head down on your pillow at night if I can put my head down on my pillow at night if I can lay my tobacco down if I can be in relationship with my spiritual items and I have a clear conscious about it that's enough right like I don't have to prove myself to anybody and that's a real hard process. That's a survivor thing too, right? Like we struggle from that perspective too. So I don't know, those are my thoughts. We're enough, it's okay. <laughs> I love that. We are enough. Sometimes when I, I, I agree that sometimes the, the most criticism comes from our own people. And I really think it's since those aren't our values, a lot of it comes from greed, greed for wanting to excel over your own brother, sister, or relative, um, greed to have nicer things that are, that are not necessarily most important that aren't as impactful to your community or to yourself. And so I, I often think about that, that being a good relative is sharing your wealth. That's always something that we've always considered to be something important for us. So I think if if you do have a self-love for yourself and love for your neighbor, share it with everyone. Do as much as you can. You're not missing out on anything. You're just creating a community of love then. So I'm like, how exciting is that? You know? So thank you. And what a great month, both within MUSAC and these webinars and out in the community. I've seen so many good things. Agreed. I love it. Creating a community of love. Shayla, Rebecca. Real quick, um, just, you know, we have our traditional values. There's 13. I don't want to misquote, but um, Hopi have like 13. Lakota have seven. I think Ojibwe have seven. There, we have all of our values. Let's just do that, man, right? Let's just follow our traditional values of bravery, wisdom, compassion, humility, blah, 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 blah. Because they're just, it's purity promises. And if we can do that, we're just going to be good all the time. So I'll pass it to Shay. Thank you, Shayla, and everyone. Thank you. No, thank you for um, the conversation today, you know, on tough topics, not only in our communities, but, you know, um, a lot of the issues we face and 
um, I just thought it was a great way to end, you know, discussing on being a good relative and what we can really do moving forward and working together and building community. So thank you everyone for listening in. Kita Tamian, thank you. Thank you. And yes, thank you, Amber and Hercules um, for providing interpretation today. Um, <clears throat> my closing thoughts are, you know, to be in order to be a good relative, um, we have to know what that feels like. And that means we have to be a good relative to ourselves first, right? And um, and start with that love and and those traditional values, whatever um, are often universal teachings that we can start as a framework. And that includes um, coming from a place of love. So I love the idea of, you know, creating communities of love. Um, and also along with that comes accountability, truth telling, hard conversations, um, reciprocity, um, and really building this um, this world that we want to be in together, and and not only talking about it, but living it, um, and recognizing that we're going to make mistakes, um, and then. And then we're going to learn from them and, and do better, right? And um, I look forward to a lot more conversations like this. You know, I'm grateful to work in a space that has not um, shied away from having hard conversations. And whenever something like this has come up, instead of turning the other way, we've jumped right in, even when it was messy and we didn't have all the answers, which we, of course, never do. Um, but we've created a space to be able to have these conversations. So I'm grateful for that. And I think that's um, certainly building a community that we want to have um, in Indian country and, and in our movement and, and on behalf of um, victims of sexual violence. So grateful to all of you. Thank you for these conversations. Thank you to everyone that was watching today. And we look forward to talking with you again. Miigwech. I just want to add one thing. If there's conversations that y'all want to have out there in the world, like let us know. We're we're interested. Those <clears> juicy <throat> conversations that you know, there's no script. It just is. Like, like contact one of us and and let's do it. <laughs> yes, let's do it. And be um also watching for an announcement. Our registration for our sex trafficking conference should be live um, tomorrow. So please um, join us in New Orleans in January for our National Sex Trafficking Conference. We have not had one since January of 2020. So we are so excited to be with you all again um, in a couple short months. So take care, everyone. Dokshaw.